is correct that we know the right answers are computed, and we know that people can identify if something goes wrong. Where did it go wrong? We can trace through and we can say something went wrong in this particular module here. This is our business logic. We have to have it correct. Okay? And external accountability, once we've sent the message out and it's gone, what accountability do we have from that remote system? Do we know the information is going to be protected there, etc.? So those are things we have to look at in the business logic. And then finally, assurance. This is a technical assurance and organizational assurance. How do we know that the design of the system is correct? How do we know that the updates are done correctly? How do we know it's configured correctly? How do we know it's maintained correctly? And then organization, how do we know that our people are good? Have you heard of insider attacks? Insider attacks are where your people are actually attacking you from inside. And this is very difficult to protect against because they, they've got the knowledge, they have all the secrets, they know how to access the system, and they do it, and they take the information out and give it away to people. So that's a really serious issue is insider attacks, but how can we protect against that? And are we compliant to the standards, and are we, do we have external auditors, etc.? So you can see it's, there's a lot of complexity in this. So here's an example security profile. For example, apply for a car license online. What levels do we need for each of these? Do we want level 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4? And you'll see they're not all the same. We assess for each of the particular components what level we want for our particular service. And that will, be, that will differ from service to service. But overall, we're saying this is the security profile that we need from all our security components in order to provide the e-service that we want. And we then draw the security case, and that case shows what the profile is, and it explains the profile, and it actually justifies why we've chosen the profile that we've chosen. So when we finish that, we'll have a lot of documentation, but we'll now be able to present the case to all the stakeholders, we'll be able to present the case to the people who are funding it, uh, to the users, and they will see that we've addressed all the security concerns, and that we've, we've justified why we've gone for the target profile. We've shown what the risks are, and we've shown what the problems are if we get hit by these risks, etc. And then we have a good, solid document which we can then start to implement. So, if you want to know more about this, the good news is you can download this documentation free of charge from the UK's government website. The, uh, the addresses and the titles of documents are there, the URL at the bottom, uh, and you can learn more and read more and apply it. And that ends my talk. Oh, put the last slide, sure. Sorry. Having in mind that our ICT gateway is still under the Israeli occupation, are there special risks and challenges would face uh, network uh, uh, authentication? I, I think you have to assume that Israel know everything. You have to assume that they, will, that they do know everything and that they will always know everything and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, there are two rich, powerful, they have too many clever people, um, they control the infrastructure, so assume that everything is not confidential in terms of the Israelis. And then you say, okay, given that we know they know everything, they're going to see everything, that's a given, uh, now what are the risks? Okay, if it's, if it's getting a car license, what's the risk of the Israelis knowing that this person has applied for a car license? Do we really care? Uh, they probably take pictures at all the roadblocks and know anyway. So is there any bigger risk from them finding out electronically who has a car than, than otherwise? And if the, if the answer is, yes, it's absolutely much worse, then you say, well, we can't offer it as an e-service. But if you say, actually, it's not much different to the situation today, then we can offer it as a service. Okay? Um, 
So I think that, you know, you have to work from that, that assumption. That's the assumption I would work from if I was building a system here. I would just assume the Israelis know everything. Sorry? Well, probably even more than, well, okay. Yeah. So. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Professor, for this uh, presentation. My name is Leif Tassis, and I'm helping Ramallah municipality to develop their e-services business model. And one of the questions I have in mind is whether cloud computing and versus investing in infrastructure and hardware in a local level and versus going to the cloud and providing e-services through the cloud computing. What's your take on that one? Thank you. Cloud services actually have a lot of, a lot of advantages. Um, they have an advantage of cost. And for a, a small company, they actually have an advantage of security. Because people or organizations like Google that run cloud services, they employ very good security people. They employ very good security procedures. So they are actually building up secure cloud services because their reputation depends on it and their business model depends on it. So if you are an organization that thinks we don't have a lot of security expertise, you could actually increase your security by using a server that's run by Google rather than a server that's run by yourself. But, but the cloud introduces other problems. It introduces problems of where is the data held? You don't actually know. What legislation is it under? You don't actually know. So what are the data privacy protection issues for data that's out there? At the moment in the UK, we have a British citizen who is actually working on a computer in the UK, building a website, all the people who accessed the website were mostly from the UK. Uh, it was for TV programs to find out where TV programs were to go and download and get them free of charge. Okay? It just so happened, he didn't know, but the actual server was running in the US. And the US are now extraditing this person under copyright violation rules to go for a 10 year prison sentence in the US. And this person has gone through all the legal procedures, he's been to the High Court, and he's been turned down, and he's ready to go for extradition in 10 years. The only thing he's got left now is the European Court of Human Rights. So if you don't know where your information is being held, you actually have some potential problems there. Yeah? But if you can actually control and say, we don't want the information to go in certain countries and we want it to be held in different countries. But the problem is with, for example, the US Patriot Act, they say that even if it flows through their country on a wire, it comes under their jurisdiction. And you don't know where the wires run and you don't know which way the con internet connects. So there are, there are some potential problems there. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Professor David. I want to say that it's not a case of discussion, and that we don't bring all the issues to the table, because the time is short, and so we'll be able to answer one question to every speaker. 